Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another video. Today, we're going over eight players that I would be stashing because I think they have massive potential upside into the rest of the fantasy football season. Now, I want to start this video off quickly by saying nothing is a guarantee in fantasy football. Some of these guys might be duds and others might change the whole course of your season. I'm going to give you all the information that I have on hand, all the statistics possible for you to make your own decisions on who to pick up. I'm telling you right now, if I had to pick, these would be the eight guys that I would select to stash on my roster. Starting it off today with Keaton Mitchell. We just talked about Keaton Mitchell in our last video, week seven waiver wire ads. He was on there for a reason. He was finally activated off the injured reserve in week number six, but sadly, he did not play in any offensive snaps in that game. This Ravens backfield right now is really wide open, in my opinion, since neither Gus Edwards or Justice Hill are proving to be consistent game-changing options on a week-to-week -week basis after jk dobbins went down in week number one you know that was really thrown out the window he was supposed to be that number one guy and now it's kind of been a split backfield between edwards and justice hill where keaton mitchell comes in is he offers insane speed and athletic ability that this ravens backfield just does not have at the moment at the combine mitchell ran a 4.37 40 yard dash which was just slightly behind jameer gibbs and Devon Achan, and you saw exactly what Achan was doing until he went on IR recently for the Dolphins. He also reached an in-game speed, Mitchell that is, of 22.6 miles per hour, which is the fastest out of any running back drafted so far this year. The only thing standing in Mitchell's way of becoming a fantasy relevant option right now is the amount of touches that he's most likely going to get over these next couple of weeks at least this isn't going to be a situation where you pick him up and he is instantly inserted into your lineup and he's a start a must start every single week he's probably going to have to gain the trust of the ravens more and more every single week increasing his offensive snaps here and there here and there until he finally breaks out or an injury boosts him up the depth chart and he gets those opportunities uh, sooner rather than later that would be ideal if you're stashing keaton mitchell of course but we're not wishing for anybody to get injured, Justice Hill or Gus Edwards in that situation. In his 2022 season at ECU, Eastern Carolina University, as a sophomore, Mitchell ran for 1,452 yards and 14 touchdowns, averaging over nine yards per carry and was also a solid receiving back. That's the main problem right now that I see with the Ravens backfield as well, is that Gus Edwards is a straight downhill runner who does not catch, rarely catches a pass, while Justice Hill is used more in the passing game and then mixed in in the running game. Why would they not want a guy that can do both in Keaton Mitchell, right? Along with the mess of the backfield that he's currently stuck in, he's got Lamar Jackson who runs the ball a ton, as we have been talking about Justice Hill and Gus Edwards. The other problem could be his height that the Ravens don't want to necessarily use him in pass blocking situations a lot, so he might be subbed out, but he still has that huge play potential and is definitely worth a roster spot in case he explodes. Like we were talking about earlier with Devon Achan on the Dolphins, this could be a very similar situation. Why not take a risk on Keaton Mitchell the rest of the season? Next up, we got Jaleel McLaughlin. If we rewind to week number four, when Javante Williams went down with that hip injury against the Chicago Bears, that's really the first time we had a chance to see McLaughlin shine. All right, him and P. Ryan took over Williams' role, and McLaughlin made the most out of it, scoring 19.4 PPR fantasy points, running for an average of 10.3 yards per carry that game, and was heavily involved in the passing game as well. Then in week five, when Williams was once again out, he scored 17.9 PPR fantasy points and was clearly the better running back over Samaji P. Ryan. yet somehow P. Ryan played 17 more snaps than uh, McLaughlin in that game. Now this past week, when Javante Williams finally returned against the Kansas City Chiefs on Thursday night, McLaughlin actually outsnapped both Javante Williams and Samaji P. Ryan in that game. Of course, this could have been a precautionary measure because Williams was in his first game back since getting injured, but this is definitely a good sign nonetheless. All right, neither of these Broncos running backs looked explosive in the first three games of the season, and McLaughlin definitely has that capability. You can see it right off the bat. He has that spark that the backfield has very much needed over the course of the season so far. I think he really just needs more opportunities at this point in time, and the Broncos might be about to give it to him and even off the field McLaughlin's story is 
very inspiring. Despite McLaughlin leading the NCAA in rushing yardage with 8,166 yards, he often would go home after big games in college and sleep in his car. How can you not root for a guy that's coming up from nothing? He's putting everything on the line to make it in this league. You think he's not going to try and ball out with his heart on the line? Okay, how can you not root for this guy to become a stud and succeed in the league? It's almost impossible. Next up, we got Rashi Rice. Over the past four weeks in particular, Rice has been having decent fantasy performances despite not even playing on over 51% of offensive snaps in any of those weeks. Week number three against Chicago, he finished with five catches for 59 yards and played on 50.6% of snaps. Week four against the Jets, three catches, 32 yards, 45.8% of snaps. Week five against the Vikings, Four catches, 33 yards, and a touchdown on only 30.3% of snaps. Then in week six against the Broncos, he finished with four catches, 72 yards, on 47.8% of snaps. This past week, Andy Reid was quoted as saying, Listen, he's been getting better every week. I think you guys see that. He's explosive, strong after the catch. So that's why, referring to why he's been playing more. Right now, he's actually fifth in target rate out of every wide receiver in the league, sitting at 32.2%, ninth in target separation, and sixth in fantasy points per route run. And this is, of course, all on limited playing time, as we've been talking about for this whole section right now. If he can get his playing time up to even around the 60 to 70 percentile mark, I think we're looking at a nasty wide receiver here. Another aspect working in Rice's favor is that for the rest of the season, a lot of these matchups are against teams that allow a ton of air yards. In the next three weeks in particular, he goes against the Chargers, Broncos, and the Dolphins. Okay, Rashi Rice could be emerging as this number one wide receiver in the Chiefs offense, and even more than that, he could be a top 20 fantasy option going forward at the wide receiver position. Next up, we have Luke Musgrave. Right now, Musgrave is currently sitting right outside the top 20 tight end, so a lot of fantasy owners might not even have this guy on their radar. The Packers are currently in a situation where Christian Watson is coming back from that injury, and then Romeo Dobbs hasn't been the most consistent number two in the league. We've certainly seen that. Two out of five weeks so far, he scored five or less fantasy points, which is definitely concerning considering we're creeping closer and closer to those fantasy playoffs. You cannot be starting a guy that's going to drop a complete dud and maybe cost you your season when the pressure's on. Since Musgrave was drafted in this 2023 draft by the Packers in the second round, we don't have a huge sample size of exactly what he can do just yet. But what we do know is that he has some freakish athleticism, especially for a tight end. Player profile has him ranked as the 15th tight end out of a possible 463 options all time. So that's very high praise. Obviously, this data could be a little bit misleading, of course. So many things have to go right for a tight end to succeed in the National Football League. But there are a few things that I do like about his situation currently. Number one is that since Jordan Love is starting for his first full season in Green Bay, Musgrave could be forming a strong connection with him early on and become a safety blanket as this season continues. Number two is that when the Packers play defenses with great cornerbacks, Musgrave is most likely going to stand the best chance of creating space out of their whole receiving core. If Christian Watson gets locked up, then you got Romeo Dobbs getting locked up. Maybe Jaden Reed gets into the mix, but I think Musgrave is a much more reliable option than Jaden Reed is going to be going forward in this offense. Number three is that Musgrave plays on the majority of snaps when healthy, runs plenty of routes, and most importantly is getting enough targets per game to be relevant in fantasy. He did drop a dud in week number four against the Detroit Lions, but that is the risk that you have to take not owning an elite tight end like Travis Kelsey, Mark Andrews, TJ Hawkinson, or even Sam Laporta so far this season. You saw exactly that happen to Logan Thomas after he had, I believe it was 10 or 11 targets in week number five. He dropped a complete dud in week number six. All I'm saying is that the numbers right here are backing up Luke Musgrave, becoming a great tight end in this league eventually. And he's not a bad guy to take a risk on uh, for the rest of the season if you don't have one of those elite options. Next up, we have Jamison Williams coming back from that gambling suspension. Jamison is quickly getting back to work in this explosive Lions offense. Week six, he found the end zone on a long touchdown along with 13.3 
PPR fantasy points. Let me tell you why exactly this is just the start of things to come for Jameson Williams. All right, Jameson Williams was drafted with the 12th pick in the 2022 draft to be an elite deep threat for this Detroit offense. Well, it just so happens that Jared Goff currently ranks first in deep ball completion percentage this year and deep ball catchable pass rate. Also ranks number one in true passer rating and QBR up to this point in the season. And his yards per attempt is the third highest in the league right now, which means he takes a ton of shots downfield where Williams is going to thrive. Jameson Williams also played for Alabama in his final college season and had over 1,500 receiving yards and 15 touchdowns against arguably some of the best competition in college football. And his average yards per catch in college was just under 20 yards. So he was going deep on a lot of routes in college as well. So Williams was elite at catching deep balls, even in college. Now the Lions so far this season have made it a point to get the running game going in most games with David Montgomery getting upwards of that 20 carry mark. Once David Montgomery is back and healthy, once Jameer Gibbs is back and healthy, this is going to make the play action game super effective, leaving Jamison Williams open down the field more times than not. He is 100% worth a stash in any sort of league, in my opinion. Next up, we got Rashid Shahid. Now, Shahid is the guy we talked about recently in our waiver wire video, week number seven. But I did say his target share was a little bit concerning to me. I would be sitting him on the bench for now and not starting him on a weekly basis. That does not mean that I don't think he could break out the rest of this season. I think he actually has one of the best chances to do that for the rest of this year. I think at the end of 2023, at the end of this season, he could easily double his stats from last year. After just six games so far this season, he already has only one less touchdown than he did in 2022 and three-fifths of his receiving yards that he did last season. And over the past couple of weeks, Shahid's snap count has been growing. Week number four, he played on 58.5% of snaps. Week number five, he saw a little bit of a decrease to 56.9% of snaps. But then week number six, that bumped all the way up to 75.6% of offensive snaps. This is definitely a significant metric to note, considering Shahid is just a massive play waiting to happen. Of course, that increases the probability that he catches a deep ball for a touchdown or whatever the case may be. Now, Alave is, of course, going to be the number one option in the Saints offense on a weekly basis who's going to see the most action majority of the time. Michael Thomas is going to be that consistent guy that can get you a first down when needed. But Rashid Shahid can easily slide into that role of being the deep threat guy in this offense for Derek Carr to rely on. Next up, we got Jackson Smith and Jigba. JSN is really in a tough spot right now. He's kind of wedged between DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett, fighting for targets and playing time every single week. But in week number six, he saw just five less snaps than DK Metcalf, four less snaps than Tyler Lockett, and all three wide receivers on this team ran the same amount of routes at 39 out of a possible 48. The talent is certainly there for JSN. He was drafted in the first round of the 2023 NFL draft with the 20th pick, had an amazing year at Ohio State, had over 1,600 receiving yards in 2021, and he also ranks top five this year in target separation, but the stats certainly don't show that because he hasn't had over six targets in any one game this year. The real reason that I would be holding on to JSN right now is in case anything happens to DK Metcalf or Tyler Lockett. DK has been getting banged up like crazy, I must say. He actually exited the game in week number six and then ended up returning. I don't want to be that guy, but I think it's only a matter of time before one of these two wide receivers misses some time. Lockett has taken, of course, his normal role in this offense, being super consistent, but nothing crazy, another, nothing out of the ordinary for Tyler Lockett. Down the stretch of this season, though, I do think the Seahawks are going to need all the help they can get in the passing game. Because in this last six games, they're going to have to face the 49ers two times, Dallas Cowboys, Philadelphia Eagles, Tennessee Titans, who have a good run defense, but not a good passing defense. And then they close it out with the Pittsburgh Steelers at the end of the fantasy football season. I think they're going to have to throw the ball a lot in those games. And JSN could benefit down the stretch of the season. Next up, we have Jalen Warren. There is one reason... One reason only why I have Jalen Warren on the bottom of this list, that's because he is on the worst offense out of anybody listed today. The Steelers defense has clearly been keeping them alive all year, and I think it's a miracle 
that they are positive heading into week number seven. So far this year, Jalen Warren has been the back to own in fantasy purely based off his pass catching. Warren's averaging five targets per game while Najee is averaging less than two per game. The snap count between the two is almost identical at this point where the com- where it's like a committee backfield, which is obviously concerning for fantasy owners of either Jalen Warren or Najee Harris. But if there's one guy to have, I do believe it is Jalen Warren, especially if Najee keeps playing poorly these next couple of weeks. Warren is currently ranking top five in yards per touch and yards per route run and top 10 in receiving yards and receptions at the running back position. This is a huge, huge bonus for PPR leagues and owning Jalen Warren in those leagues, not so much in standard leagues, but he's definitely proving uh, worthwhile stash in those PPR leagues. I could sit here and try to sell you that the Steelers have a pretty difficult schedule heading forward, but the truth is that it really doesn't matter who the Steelers play at this moment in time because their offensive line is performing so badly. This is going to give less room for Najee Harris to operate and more opportunities for Jalen Warren to be involved in this passing game because if the running game can't get going, they're going to have to pass the ball. It's as simple as that. Anyways, guys, as always, if you enjoyed this video, make sure to drop a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel if you are new. Also, go follow my Twitter. Just made a new Twitter. If you guys want some more in-depth stats, whatever the case may be, I'll be tweeting a lot over there. Just uh, I'll leave their link in the description below and also the pinned comment. So go drop a follow over there. I will catch you guys in the next video. Peace out. Have a great day.